indebted to the speakers who have accepted our invitation to continue this reflection on the existing multilateral cooperation across the Atlantic. Uh, we hope to learn a great deal from your experiences and to identify opportunities for future collaboration with the Atlantic Center. Among all the speakers, allow me, of course, a special word of thanks to our keynote speaker, Dr. Bashir Jamut, Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Safety Agency. Sir, we're delighted to host you and your delegation in Lisbon and to hear, of course, on the important role that NIMASA is playing on maritime security in the Gulf uh, of Dania. Today's seminar uh, is dedicated to mapping and understanding better some of the most relevant multilateral cooperation formats in the Atlantic and ad adjacent regions, particularly those formats uh, with an impact on security and defense. The Atlantic is a diverse region marked by important differences, for instance, in the level of institutionalization, but with dense patterns of interaction that require uh, our attention. The Atlantic Center is a new initiative and will certainly benefit from the lessons learned by its partners in its ambition to support a truly whole of Atlantic view of security. Allow me just a final word of appreciation to the team at the Ministry of Defense that made this seminar possible. You all did an amazing job, so thank you so much. And I wish you all a fruitful day of discussions. Thank you. We now invite the Director of the National Defense Institute, Professor Elena Guerreiras, to deliver her welcome remarks. Uh, Professor João Gomes Corvin, Minister of uh, National Defense. Dr. Bashir Yusuf Jamul, uh, Director General and CEO of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. Professor Alicine Simão, Coordinator of the Atlantic Center, Distinguished um, Ambassadors, uh, Civilian and Military Authorities, dear guests, good afternoon. Let me first start by expressing my sincere joy in welcoming you all to the National Defense Institute. To organize an event uh, of this size and magnitude with a live audience is a uh, testament to how far we have arrived since nearly a year and a half ago. At the same time, we have acknowledged, of course, the possibilities that the remote technologies allow us on this, um, this occasion. Uh, this is why this opening ceremony, as was already underlined, um, and other parts of the event are or will be live streamed through our YouTube channel, thus reaching an audience that otherwise we would uh, not be able to include throughout the afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, the Atlantic Center has gathered considerable momentum uh, over the last uh, year and a half with the development of new ideas and the multiplication of joint activities in a parallel track. This comes as a clear demonstration of the collective demand and political will to move forward with such valuable initiative, while at the same time encouraging us to press onwards by delineating in more precise terms where the Atlantic Center should focus its efforts and attention and what it should eventually become from an institutional point of view. The participation of IDN has generated very concrete outputs in the implementation of this agenda. For instance, the annual Atlantic uh, Center Seminar, the third of which is taking place right now, has already become a regular event at IDN, prompting discussions over topics of common interest when attempting to promote new venues for dialogue and contact across the ocean. IDN has also assisted in creating the first ever online repository of publications exclusively focused on the Atlantic, while making available open access to the proceedings from previous seminars. Only by pursuing further openness in the content uh, and knowledge that we generate in our daily work can we live up to the mandate of reaching the four corners of this broad region and encompass all in equal measure. Hence, we have recently created, in partnership with the Russo-American Foundation, FLAG, the Atlantic Security Awards, 
which will allow the Atlantic Center and IBM uh, to develop its in-house cap capabilities to conduct research on security-related issues and to promote policy-oriented contributions for how our academic community and decision ma makers alike. But every effort towards more dialogue and reflection invariably requires a minimum of shared capacity to become truly effective. Uh, therefore, IBM helped design and implement the first ever course on maritime security of the Atlantic Center, which took place in the Azores um, last May. We will be sure to repeat this experience next spring with a course thematically focused on linkages between human security and the maritime domain, and we expect to gather a similar level of engagement and interest from every participating country. Today, however, we are called upon to explore what makes us come together as different countries from different parts of the Atlantic, often under varying banners, formats, and geometries. As uh, Professor Alicina Simão just mentioned, the multilateral dimension stands out as a natural area for debate if the goal is to seek out key lessons learned that can be incorporated in future activities. In that sense, the seminar could not have come in a better occasion to provide us with the necessary input and clarity. I wish you all a very productive afternoon and look forward to uh, follow the future developments of the Atlantic Center with great enthusiasm. Thank you. His Excellency, the Portuguese Minister of National Defense, João Gomes Cravinho, will now address the audience. Professor Elena Carreira is director of the National Defense Institute. Uh, Dr. Jumo, director general and CEO of MIMASA. Professor Licinia Simão, coordinator of the Atlantic Center. Ambassadors, excellencies, illustrious guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, present here in the auditorium and online. Good afternoon for those of you who are in the auditorium. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone for those of you online. The Atlantic Center, it's a very young institution, but uh, this seminar, the annual seminar, now at the third edition, is becoming the milestone event in the development of this initiative. We have, of course, enormous amount of difficulties with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And of course, we are very much aware that this uh, deeply affects still today uh, many of the countries across the Atlantic region. And, uh, but despite this, we have been able to gather experts, partners, friends of the Atlantic Center to discuss the relevance of reinforcing cooperative formats that bring together the Atlantic states and, and communities. The two previous editions of the seminar were instrumental for the development of the Atlantic Center. I recall the first seminar in 2019 when we gathered around 30 experts here at the Institute of National Defense to help us to shape the future Atlantic Center to, according to the needs of different partners and meeting demands for more dialogue, more knowledge, and more capacity building. The Gulf of Guinea was one of the central topics that we addressed then and it has since remained prominent on our agenda. A year later, fully into the COVID-19 pandemic, we adapted to a hybrid event, much like the, the one that we are having now, to continue this discussion. We dealt with crisis management in the Atlantic, exploring lessons learned and operational responses with a focus on space-based technologies. More than 20 experts, policymakers, and operational experts from different sectors, civilian and military, and from different nationalities joined in the very fruitful debates. The 2021 edition, this one, the third edition, marks the closing of a cycle for uh, this annual seminar. Much like in the previous years, we have maintained a restrictive format for the more substantive panels under Chatham House rules. 
although we have a fairly large audience in the room and following us uh, online, only a larger one, we all understand that the benefits of speaking freely uh, without attribution need to be fully used in uh, our work. Now, this model has allowed the Atlantic Center to benefit from frank discussions and ideas, and I'm certain that this will continue to be the case once more today. The natural drawback is that we lose some access in terms of the outreach to the Atlantic Society that also have to, that also, also come to express a growing interest in this uh, initiative. So our expectation is therefore that next year's event will fully benefit from a more so secure global health environment and thus allowing us to gather more speakers in Lisbon and to become fully public, turning the Atlantic Center outwards and establishing this seminar as a regular milestone event in Atlantic security. This logic, this logic is further reinforced as we enter a new stage in the Atlantic Center. We are currently a group of 19 countries that have signed a political declaration stating our commitment to the principles guiding this initiative and to the development of this initiative. We have been encouraged by the accession of new members, the most recent of which was Cameroon, and we are delighted to welcome the Cameroonese delegation to this seminar. And we are encouraged by the growing interest that the Atlantic Center is gathering, not only in the ministries of defense, of our Atlantic partners, but also in other areas of government, and namely the foreign ministries across our societies. As well as the delegations here present, today we also have the pleasure of hosting several ambassadors. So thank you for joining us, ambassadors. We have, I would like to add, recently uh, announced the creation of two annual research awards in a partnership between the Atlantic Center, the National Defense Institute, and the Luso American Foundation, whose sponsorship we truly appreciate. And we are also advancing our collaboration with Safe Seas from Denmark and working to deepen our research capacity and partnership with research centers and universities in the three Atlantic continents for the development of a report on Atlantic security and great power competition. We will continue our training and capacity building activities, organizing the second edition of the course on maritime security in the Azores next uh, May. And we look forward to the Portuguese Air Force hosting us once more at the Lages Air Base, and together with the regional government of Azores, receiving a new group of trainees to address the nexus between maritime security and human security. I'm certain that the good collaboration of the joint defense uh, staff of the armed forces will want once more reinforce the practical and hands-on approach of these trainings as well as with the Office for Equality of the Ministry of Defense, ensuring uh, inclusion in this exercise of an important dimension on gender equality. Several other training opportunities are being developed, including in the domain of space, given its importance in monitoring and securing the vast Atlantic area. But maritime governments and support for the Yaoundé architecture remain, in our view, two main priorities for many of us in the Atlantic, including Portugal. And this is why capacity building initiatives will focus on this area, contributing to reinforcing state sovereignty at sea, regional coordination, and contributing to greater mutual knowledge of existing initiatives, complementarity, and sharing of best practices. We are looking forward to deepening cooperation in this field with the coastal states of the Gulf of Guinea and with regional structures and institutions. And I am particularly pleased to Count Rear uh, Admiral Narciso Fastudo Jr., Executive Director of the Interregional Coordination Center of the Yaoundé Architecture amongst today's speakers. The development of the Atlantic Center is a commitment of the Portuguese government in line with our foreign and defense priorities. For us, driving the establishment of a multilateral platform for dialogue and cooperation among all Atlantic nations is an ambitious but timely initiative. There has never, this has never been done before, but the times in which we are living require us to come together in this manner. The international context has shifted and continues to change rapidly and dramatically. We must adapt, we must make the best use of the tools available to ensure peaceful relations in our regions and areas of interest. 
and through that to contribute to global peace and security. The challenges are wide ranging, from the sustainability of resources to managing the human impacts of climate change to fighting illegal and criminal activities that undermine security and the well-being of populations. And of course, we must certainly add to this list the potentially negative impacts that growing geopolitical rivalry already have for the stability of the Atlantic and for its global rel relevance. So it is of vital interest, therefore, to affirm the centrality and the unique role of the Atlantic in global economics, in international relations, in the global fight against climate change, and ultimately as a region of peaceful and cooperative relations. By pursuing an approach of small but solid steps, Portugal expects the Atlantic Center to respond to this ambition, or rather, to this need. It is our responsibility to make the best use of Portugal's long-standing good relations with all nations across the Atlantic to foster dialogue and cooperation. Working together in joint ownership, building common projects that, pres that respond to the security needs of all involved will take time and it will be challenging, but we are here for the long run. We are building the Atlantic Center to last for many decades. So we have time on our side and that will certainly make a substantive difference to the quality of relations that we develop in this context. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to particularly thank the National Defense Inst Institute for its unwavering support to the organization of the seminars of the Atlantic Center, as well as to many of its activities, as the Director Professor Elena Carreiros has just mentioned. This partnership is a valuable illustration of how win-win solutions can be found when facing new opportunities. The Institute represents much more than a host and an experienced team available to support the Atlantic Center. Beyond that, it has also been a driving force for its conceptual development and a constant partner with whom to exchange and dialogue on the, cha on the challenges ahead. The Institute has made its extensive network of friends and collaborators available to meet and to know the Atlantic Center. And I know that the National Defense Institute will continue to reinforce its research capacity and to diversify its training and outreach activities with new partners across the Atlantic. So I invite all of you to engage with this initiative, to learn more about Atlantic security and to find ways to engage your organizations and your countries with the Atlantic Center. Professor Licinia Simão is the new coordinator following on the footsteps of Brigadier General Nuno Lemes Pires, who has been deployed to Mozambique as a commander of the European Union training mission. She has been mandated to make the best use of these vast partnerships and to harness the potential of our joint work to push this agenda of regional peace and security forward. And with that, I wish you all a fruitful day of work and I look forward to hearing about the conclusions of your work today. Thank you. We invite the Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, Dr. Bashir Yusuf Jamo, for the keynote speech. Thank you very much, <coughs> Minister of National Defense, Director of the National Defense Institute, coordinator of, of the Atlantic Center, ambassadors and excellencies, guests and participants in the third seminar of the Atlantic Center, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to in, be invited to deliver a keynote speech this distinguished, highly informed, and esteemed audience. Hilary Bellwald once said that, if there is one portion of Europe which was made by the sea more than another, Portugal is that slice. That portion, that belt, Portugal was made by the Atlantic. No wonder we are here at this Atlantic Center 
So let me congratulate you all for being here today. The Atlantic Ocean is a vast body of water, the second largest in the world after the Pacific. The Atlantic extends to five continents of North and South America, Europe, Africa, and Antarctica. It is therefore very important to ensure its safety and security for the sustenance of the international trade and all the highly valuable benefits derivable from the Atlantic seas. Then, who is responsible for the ocean governance and maritime safety in this context? At the national level, every coastal state has an obligation to ensure the safety of navigation in its territorial water seas up to 12 nautical miles by ensuring proper and effective enforcement of its flag state implementation and post-state control responsibility. The Director General of Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, Dr. Bashir safety came on board and summarized the administration agenda and into triple F, which are maritime security, maritime safety, and shipping development. Maritime when I came in, I tried to subdue the entire and uh, strategy of uh, given that vision state into three years, economic rise over the resources of their seas, maritime security, to maritime nautical miles, and, shipping and sometimes three years. beyond. Under the maritime security to ensure that we maintain the United Nations General Assembly and, uh, is obviously environment the recognized body shipping on the ocean to strive. Without As security, maritime security is very difficult for us to have our ships uh, you know, moving in and around or outside the country. And the investors may not be able to come. So the first priority when I came uh, is to ensure that we maintain a very good uh, maritime security network. Maritime security may dealt a major, major threat to doing maritime businesses in Nigeria and the, the Gulf of Guinea. In the process of changing a number of protocols and resolutions on sustainable use of the resources of the oceans. The International Maritime Organization, IMO, on the other hand, sets technical and safety standards and has adopted so many international legal instruments on the safety of navigation, including marine pollution and prevention and control. The maritime security. Criminality and insecurity at seas caused by acts of piracy, armed robbery, and other dangerous activities aren't a new phenomenon. Pirates and piratical attacks have happened more than 2,000 years, which arguably may never be completely eradicated. However, with advancements in the technology resulting in faster, bigger, and sophisticated vessels, that have increasingly and seemingly facilitated international commerce, faster connectivity of global supply chain has enhanced the growth of the world economy through the marine transportation of high-valued cargoes across the world, oceans, and seas. Piracy and other criminality also grow in a scale of intensity. The water volume of the Atlantic is about 310 million, 410,000, 900 cubic kilometers, and about 25% of the global oceans. Therefore, no single country or body can adequately and consistently police or patrol to ensure security, maintaining safety and security against the piracy. I'm wrongly illegal and unreported, unregulated fishing, trafficking of drugs and other psychotropic substances, etc. Within the Atlantic, a massive bodies of waters require multiple approaches, which include one, legal and regulatory enforcement, two, effective naval force for patrol and surveillance, Three, technology for maritime domain awareness and infrastructure. Four, 
intelligence and information sharing and transparency. And five, multinational and multilateral cooperation and collaboration. Nigeria realizes the importance of security on its own seas and oceans to the international trade. Economic progress and well-being of the country has taken a pragmatic approach to the security within the sphere of the Atlantic Ocean. In, 19, in 2018, Nigeria executed a contract with a firm for an integrated national maritime surveillance and security infrastructure, that is Deep Blue Project, as a robust tool to combat piracy, arm robbery, and other maritime crimes within the Nigeria's territorial water and by extension, the Gulf of Guinea. The Deep Blue Project consists of sea, air, and land assets, including the command, control, computer, and communication information center, C4I. The deployment of this asset was flagged up by the president, Muhammad Buhari GCFR, on the 10th June 2021, with a goodwill message from the International Maritime Organization Secretary General, Mr. Kitak Lib. To further bluster Nigeria's effort in fighting crimes at sea, the government signed into law the Separation of Piracy and Other Maritime Offenses Act, popularly known as FOMO Act 2019. This piece of legislation gave effect in Nigeria to the provisions of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea on Clause 1982, on the suppression of international convention and suppression of unlawful acts against safety of navigation, SOA 1998 and its protocol. Since the law came into effect, convention of conviction of at least 20 pirates have been secured under the act with the offenders currently serving various jail terms. At the regional level, following the United Nations Security Council resolution of 2011 and 2012, calling on countries in the ECOWAS and ECAS and the Gulf of Guinea to work together on the strategy to fight piracy, arm robbery, and other illegal activities at sea, the Gulf of Guinea, Nigeria joined other states and government to sign Yaoundé Declaration on the 25th June 2013 to collaborate in the fight against piracy and other crimes in the Atlantic Oceans. The declaration known as the declarations known as Yaoundé Declaration led to the establishment of the Interregional Coordination Center, ICC Yaoundé. Further to this, Nigeria, together with the ICC Yaoundé, is engaged with the major international shipping industry and commodity groups, Intertanko, Intercargo, ICS, OCIMF, BIMCO, to develop framework known as Gulf of Guinea Maritime Collaboration Forum on the Shared Awareness and Deconfliction, that is Gulf of Guinea MCV slide shared. The framework is a multilateral initiative involving industry stakeholders and member countries in the West and Central Africa and the Gulf of Guinea on the information sharing and incident reporting. Cooperation at sea and the air deconfliction, the G7++ friend Gulf of Guinea is another multinational collaboration with the regional countries on the maritime security in the Gulf of Guinea. Whilst multilateral and multinational collaboration and cooperation are desirable for maintaining safety and security of not only Atlantic, but the entire ocean and seas of the planet Earth. However, such must be done within the complex wave of the international relations and diplomacy, so as not to undermine the sovereignty of the territorial integrity of any country, big or small. Therefore, while appreciating the principle of mere liberal, a unilateral declaration by the private entities to deploy warships to the waters 
contiguous to the Atlantic seas of the West Africa is not amiable to a good international relations. Likewise, the idea of coordinated maritime presence, CMP scheme, used by some countries to deploy frigate to Atlantic oceans of West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea should be with the consent and agreement of the countries within the subcontinent in line with the international laws as a mark of respect for the dignity of their people and the sovereignty of their nations at the continental level. Nigeria is a party to the Charter of Maritime Security and Safety and Development in Africa, signed in September 2016 in Lome, Togo, popularly known as Lome uh, Charter. One of the objectives of this charter is to prevent and suppress national and transitional crime, including terrorism, piracy, armed robbery against ship, drug trafficking, smuggling of migrants, trafficking in fashion, and all other kinds of trafficking through the sea and illegal fishing. Nigeria's effort in deploying huge resources to maintain maritime security is gradually crystallizing, going by the latest encouraging January to September 2021 International Maritime Bureau report on Nigeria and Gulf of Guinea. It is my hope, therefore, that this seminar will come up with the recommendation and suggestion for the strengthening and collectively beneficial multinational and multilateral strategic initiative for stronger, effective communication, cooperation, collaboration, and coordination in ensuring the security of the Atlantic, which constitutes about 25% of the world ocean described as common heritage of mankind. Before I leave, permit me to use this auspicious moment to make just two appeals. One, the international maritime business community to recognize the improvement in security in Nigerian waters and reciprocate by removing the war risk insurance premium charge on cargoes bound for Nigeria. The three quarters of consistent decline as reported by no less than the institute than International Maritime Bureau can be considered, cannot be considered as flawed. The second appeal is to our nations and friends to the International Maritime Organization. It is also time to return Nigeria to the membership of Category C in the post-coming IMO Council election in the few weeks to come. We ask for your vote and count on your continuous confidence in the effort of Nigeria to work in partnership with other nation states in the Gulf of Guinea and to continue keeping our corridor of the Atlantic Ocean a safe passage for seafarers, their vessel and vital supply, the transport for our common sustenance. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, I thank you so very much indeed for your attention. Long live Lisbon, Obrigada. <laughs> thank you very much. So hello, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here on this side now with additional responsibilities um, to try to make sense of these, um, this extraordinary afternoon of discussions um, and, and very enriching. I, to those of you online uh, or here who didn't get the chance to, to participate and, and, and watch, um, it's a shame we will be uh, producing a report as we have done in the past, in the previous, um, um, in the previous seminars of the Atlantic Center, which hopefully will be published by the National Defense Institute. Um, and we will try to gather all the uh, wonderful contributions that we received today. So thank you so much to all the speakers for their generosity, for their uh, time, um, for the, to the chairs who moderated these sessions and, and did such a wonderful job in, in getting all the key questions um, out. Um, I, I would like to 
um, perhaps start by giving a few uh, clues on how we see the development of the Atlantic Center. Many of you were invited here without actually knowing very much about the initiative uh, and where it is going next. Uh, and then I would uh, perhaps uh, wrap up with, with key takeaways from, from this session. The, the Atlantic Center is an initiative that is being developed uh, with a mandate from the Portuguese government. Um, the, the object um, has changed and is, I think, continuously evolving. We don't see that as a weakness. We see it actually as its strength because it has been evolving according to the dialogues that we are establishing with, um, with all the partners that have engaged. Uh, we are adapting to also the context and the needs that have uh, arised. So in that sense, we feel that it's, it's, it's just making the process stronger. Um, the, the Ministry of Defense is a driving force and is mandated by the government to develop the center. So it's only natural that the center has security and defense at its core, uh, but, um, and I think um, Ana Paula Moreira from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will certainly corroborate to that, we have a view of security that is broad. And I think that touches upon many of the issues that were raised here today is that um, having ships at sea is important, but they will not solve all the issues, all the security issues that we have identified in the Atlantic. Ships at sea will not respond to all the insecurities that we are aware of. Uh, and so the Ministry of Defense alone and the armed forces alone uh, will certainly um, have a limited contribution to what security and defense in the Atlantic means. So in that sense, we are, at least in this early stages, opening our discussions around what security in the Atlantic means. Later on, we will have to make this more clear cut. We will have to choose which topics are more relevant, prominent, and, and timely for us to address. But at this point, and over the last two, three years uh, in which I have been be I've been engaged in the initiative, we have deliberately kept uh, an encompassing view of security so that we can understand what is more urgent and timely to, to address. And I think um, it has been a good decision, a wise decision, because slowly key topics and priorities um, be crystallize and we understand that they are a priority not only for Portugal, which is driving the initiative and for the Portuguese government. We, we heard about the importance of Azores and uh, giving um, the visibility uh, that these key positions in the Atlantic represent for many of us, but um, the priorities that we have identified have been complemented by the priorities of other partners. And we are fortunate at this stage to be speaking uh, with partners from the three, four continents, depends on how you look at it, uh, that, that are in the, in the uh, that are Atlantic continents. Um, and so I hope that we can just enlarge that number of countries. We are 19 countries at this stage who have signed uh, that, a political declaration, and that's the basis for our work as we stand. So there is a, uh, if you want, um, a commitment of principle to develop the center uh, and to develop its activities. So it is very much uh, activity driven, output driven at this stage. Uh, and we go um, and we go from there to, to respond to the needs that we see. Another specific aspect of the Atlantic Center that um, has become key is that we, we, want to, we want to work on the principle of complementarity. So, and that has been highlighted by uh, all the speakers is that we don't need um, more initiatives, putting a strand on resources that are scarce, that need to be well managed. We all have a lot of uh, uh, initiatives to respond to. So let's, let's identify the areas where this initiative can complement uh, and bring added value. And the first, uh, area where added value is, is, is present and is, I think we all agree to, is um, the need for constant dialogue. I don't believe in too much dialogue um, and, and especially not when the geopolitical context is changing so fast. So for us to be providing a platform where uh, different Atlantic countries can 
discuss how they perceive these accelerated changes that are ongoing and where we can dissipate tensions or uh, avoid misunderstandings from the early start. Uh, that is for me, I think, um, a service to uh, regional peace and security. So the, the, the political platform that we would like to establish um, or that we are already establishing at different levels, starting uh, with the ministries of defense, but already with a, a very significant participation of the ministries of foreign affairs and other sectoral ministries that by nature of the institutional settings of the different Atlantic countries are slowly coming uh, into, this, uh, into this dialogue, I think we are um, taking good steps in making sure that um, we, we keep um, uh, a crisis, uh, crisis uh, um, a conflict prevention approach, if you want, and very much focused on keeping, um, building trust through knowledge, through, through dialogue. So uh, a, a platform that brings all the Atlantic countries on board uh, in that regard is, is, is of added value. And, and it is, um, as the minister mentioned this morning, something that hasn't been done before. So we are slowly uh, building that. Um, regarding the, the issue of research, we, we, there is a lot of issues that we need to, to address. Um, if, we, if we hear all the speakers today, there are many, uh, there's a great deal of, there is a, a great lack of information in many areas, um, concrete information, information that can serve the definition of public policies that can inform public policy and decision-making. Uh, that can shape the attribution of resources to the specific problems that we face. Uh, we will certainly not solve all those problems. <laughs> there would be too much for us to do alone, but um, teaming up with others may give us an added advantage. And this is also the case with the National Defense Institute that is hosting us today, is that the Atlantic Center doesn't need to do the research from scratch uh, itself. It can provide the input for um, research that is of interest to the partners who, that are on board of this initiative to be addressed in partnership with others. So um, that, that I would say is, is, is a way to go forward, is to highlight specifically and timely uh, aspects that need to be researched, that need to be studied in order to assist in the development of public policies. And we can put that in the agenda and we can uh, create the partnerships to get the results uh, out there uh, um, in a timely fashion. So we will be certainly uh, defining some of the priorities. I can tell you that um, this idea of great power competition uh, is already on the table and we are looking to develop a report uh, sometime early next year, during spring next year on what, it, what does exactly mean uh, the rise of great power competition for the Atlantic as a whole, because Often what you have is partial studies that address the presence of uh, the growing presence of China in Africa or the growing presence of Russia in, uh, in Latin America or um, greater EU engagement in Africa or the US. What does this mean in practice when you, when you look at it from the Atlantic as a whole, more Russian presence in Latin America, how does that affect the Arctic uh, or how, uh, are Russian and Chinese strategies in Africa affecting the Mediterranean or elsewhere. So bringing together an integrated perspective of the balances of the Atlantic is something that we would like that report to do. And we're working with partners to have, um, to have a participated uh, report. So um, we are doing that. We are certainly working also in, uh, in studies that are helping us understand what the specific approaches to capacity building, for instance, can be for the Atlantic Center. We are committed to a series of principles we would like to implement. Um, and one of them has to do with ownership, which was something that was also raised um, a lot today, is that we need to design um, the, the trainings and the capacity, capacity building processes with those who will benefit from them. So rather than coming in with a pre-formatted um, uh, training course, having the, the time to develop it 
in tandem and in cooperation with the partners that will benefit from that, with the countries from specific regions that we want to address in the trainings, will take time, will be much more demanding, but the process itself is something that we can benefit from, not only just the training. And, and this, is, this is just one example um, of, of, the of the guiding principles we would like um, the training activities and the capacity building activities of the Atlantic Center to reflect. Uh, and uh, we are hoping to have that report. Uh, Rita is here and Pedro is back there. They're both working on that report. And hopefully we can have a food for thought paper. That's, that's actually what it is on, on what, what, what will be the difficulties of implementing uh, specific approaches to, the, to capacity building. What are the niches that the center can can um, can can make the best of, um, and and finally, and this of course has um, has an impact on the overall view of the Atlantic Center. Um, these three tiers are not silos; they speak to each other, they feed into each other, and that's how we would like to see it. Um, it was very interesting uh, listening today about the views from the navies or those who came, who, the speakers that were naval officers today because uh, they, they, they spoke about the military presence and the reinforcement of the military presence uh, in the Atlantic and how that can help other strategies by, uh, by supporting not only the fight against illegal activities in the ocean, but also as Carmen mentioned in supporting um, uh, communities in the face of climate change uh, dramatic events. Uh, climate related events uh, and, and and this is something that we need to consider side by side with other responses more military presence where in what shape how the u has now the coordinated military um, maritime presences happening uh, in in thinking of the gulf of guinea and, and and the fight against piracy this is a good example of how increased or more coordinated military presences can actually be beneficial and, and well received. Uh, so we need to understand what is specifically the role and the place for, for the armed forces to be, to be involved. Um, I was also very, um, I also took note of what uh, Anna uh, mentioned now um, in this final panel about the importance of having dialogues on hard security issues. And also the speaker that um, addressed the issue of the Arctic also mentioned that, is that especially in the context of rising tensions, um, having the formats for addressing hard security issues is important through dialogue, um, even if this needs then to be complemented by other areas that are less um, political uh, or, or potentially hard, where dialogue can be harder, but it's important to have areas and formats where hard issues can be addressed in a frank and open manner. And, and this is something that we are, of course, very keen to provide if the participating states uh, feel that that's something that they need. And that's perhaps um, um, the, a final remark, besides the issue that I mentioned in my, in my comment in the last panel about perceptions and identities, building a, a common Atlantic identity is, is something that can only make sense um, on specific issues. And it has to be built on the respect of the differences that are in many cases very marked in the Atlantic. Uh, so respecting those differences of perspective and respecting uh, and understanding them uh, will certainly allow us to have a more coherent approach, which we can call whole of Atlantic um, uh, my, my, my final remark uh, is, of course, on, is to invite uh, all of you to continue uh, your engagement with this initiative. Um, we will be adding you to our mailing list, which we call the Friends of the Atlantic Center. So consider yourselves friends of this initiative as of today. And we hope that you can come to us as well in terms of identifying opportunities for cooperation. And we are happy to um, make your initiatives visible as long as they are in line with the objectives that are set for the Atlantic Center for this vision that I presented to you now. So hopefully this will be just another moment of enlarging our network of friends uh, and raising new opportunities for collaboration in the future. So thank you very much to all of you today for, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks so much.
we invite Professor Patricia Deinhardt, head researcher of the Reflection Group on the Atlantic from the National Defense Institute to deliver some words. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, Professor Elicinha Simão, Dr. Ana Paula Moreira, um, distinguished speakers, invited uh, guests here in the room and uh, online. First of all, I would like to express my thanks to uh, the coordinator of the Atlantic Center, Professor Elicinha Simão, for the invitation to participate in the third seminar on the Atlantic Center. I would also like to uh, express my thanks to the uh, director of the National Defense Institute, Professor uh, Elena Kareides. And um, I would like to thank also for the opportunity that was given to me to speak here as the coordinator of the reflection group on the Atlantic, which I um, lead together with Professor Carlos Gaspar here at the National Defense Institute. This reflection group on the Atlantic is a forum for debate on transatlantic and European issues relevant to foreign and defense policies within the North Atlantic area and which brings together experts from research centers and ministries, academics, diplomats, parliamentarians, and the military. The Atlantic, of course, is an area particularly relevant for Portugal. As a country located in the middle of the Atlantic, as a geographically most Western member of the European Union, and with the archipelagos of the Azores and Madeira, Portugal has followed a multivectorial foreign policy simultaneously focusing its interests on the European continent, the transatlantic dimension and relations with the United States and in the South relations with South America and on the whole of Western Africa. The reflection group on the Atlantic thus followed with interest the development of the Atlantic Center. It's launching in May of this year on the Azores island of Terceira and the signing of the center's declaration by now, I hear 19 states to foster and promote a more integrated security approach to Atlantic issues. It has been a particular pleasure for me today to accompany the workings and the proceedings of the seminar on the security ecosystem in the Atlantic and to listen to the ideas on good practices and lessons learned and reflections on existing formal and informal cooperative multilateral and multinational initiatives that address security issues in the Atlantic. This afternoon's fruitful discussions allow me to reflect on its findings and where potential synergies can be found to facilitate engagement between the Atlantic Center and the reflection group regarding some common interest in the future in trying to address common security threats and challenges. Regarding NATO, in the post-Cold War period, the alliance remained indeed a regional alliance because its center continued to be the pluralist security community in the North Atlantic area, whose political and territorial integrity is guaranteed by the Washington Treaty. At the same time, though, the alliance consolidated itself as the main international organization with global responsibilities because it became the core institution guaranteeing international security and stability in an area not limited to the North Atlantic area. More recently, recognizing the increasing international instability due to geopolitical great power competition, NATO has now embarked on defining its new strategic concept, which it will adopt um, early or, or next year, in the first semester of next year, after 11 years. At its last summit in Brussels in June 2021, NATO's communique identified the containment of Russia and collective defense as NATO's strategic priority. However, the emergence of China as a disruptive factor and its qualification as NATO's systemic rival has changed this perception, giving the potential for a diminished transatlantic consensus on how to deal with this new global actor on the one hand, and the possibility of a strategic convergence 
between Russia and China against allied democracies. For Portugal, this means an increased interest in a European and Atlantic consensus on how to evaluate China's international strategies and on how to avoid the consolidation of a new alliance between these two countries. This raises two points. First, as the global stability of the international system is at stake, NATO assumes more global responsibilities beyond the North Atlantic Ocean. While the alliance of democracies that US President Joe Biden refers to does not necessarily mean the enlargement of NATO, it does signal the willingness of the democracies of the alliance to cooperate with democracies outside the alliance, including those of the South Atlantic, to maintain and reinforce international stability in a model of strengthened partnerships between like-minded countries with the declared interest in ensuring the stability of their region. Thus, the Alliance has every interest in cooperating with the democracies in the South Atlantic in a concert between like-minded countries that cooperate to dissuade non-democratic powers that might put the international balance at risk. This applies to the South as much as to the High North. One example of such responsibility lies in what the Atlantic Center's um, policy brief published a year ago identified as the growing competition between Atlantic and non-Atlantic powers, which is expected to further increase with the opening up of the Arctic route and taking a toll in maritime dynamics. Second, it is important that the whole of the Atlantic remains an area free from external interference from non-democratic powers. This interference can have implications for the overall maritime security of the Atlantic at the level of the freedom of navigation and commercial routes, geopolitics of cables, as was referred to here today, or deep sea mining, or in developments in coastal areas with effect for the Atlantic country, Atlantic country as a whole. Thus, as the policy brief states, again, keeping the Atlantic as an area of peace and security in itself an indispensable, indispensable precondition for investment, trade, development, and prosperity is a priority of every Atlantic partner, North or South. In this sense, the reinforcement of strategic partnerships with the pluralist democracies of the Atlantic and beyond would mean elevating NATO's partnerships in the wider Atlantic area to a higher level, also given the possibility of an anti-Western coalition between the two revisionist powers. Thus, the challenges that the Atlantic as a whole faces are big, and as we've heard today, they are increasing, even if the Atlantic as at the moment is not an area of geostrategic competition per se, as was just stated in the last session. But in the medium term, this can contribute to making the alignment of threat perceptions or defense and security priorities between the many different Atlantic states even more difficult, given their different national interests, the different regional areas, this might become increasingly difficult. Today's seminar has thus reflected on these and other topics related to the challenges emerging in the wider Atlantic, and I would like to quickly um, comment on its two working sessions by picking up some of its main ideas. The first session focused on the intersection and overlapping of multilateral entities in the Atlantic and on mapping good practices and lessons learned arising from this interaction. First, the mapping of institutional lessons learned. How to fit, how fit for purpose are the existing institutions and cooperation mechanisms today was one of the questions. To what, to what extent would they benefit from a wider membership or not? And how should these existing institutions adapt? Second, for example, in the domain of maritime security, best practices have shown the utility of naval forces at sea to respond to diverse maritime threats. For example, increasingly, the North Atlantic depends on the maritime security in the South 
and vice versa, so showing that partnership frameworks in the South already exist. Thirdly, on NATO and EU corporations, both organizations have found a way of complementing each other in three main drivers in maritime security, as was mentioned here in the first session, namely coherence, complementarity, and interoperability. And finally, the relevance of the Atlantic Center to help link different areas between the wider Atlantic and to bridge the link between the North Atlantic, the Arctic, and the South, and the importance of increasing linkage between issues of hard security, maritime and human security, and also climate change, clearly highlight the need for this institutions, institution, which is, as somebody uh, uh, called it also, an attempt to become pan-Atlantic or overall encompassing, linking the North and the South. The second session, focused on less visible fora and more informal solutions, but with considerable po potential for this debate, including informal dialogue platforms and multinational exercises due to variable geometries. First, the main advantages of an informal approach are efficiency of tailor-made responses, the flexibility of the pick and choose approach, the transparency that informality allows for, and a more practice oriented approach, which can avoid over-institutional um, emphasis. Second, the success of each informal initiative is at the end of the day, what states make of it, if I can use that term borrowed from constructivism, as it depends on the participating countries, political commitments that associated states choose to make or not to make. Thirdly, shifting identities and changing perceptions seem to be better accommodated and in, in informal coalitions of the willing. I know there's a no negative connotation to this expression of coalitions of the willing, but I actually think it, it fits quite nicely into this approach of informality, of multilateralism, uh, where we can look at different formal um, and informal or informal coalitions, big or small, but which show the willingness of the member states to effectively engage in cooperating in addressing uh, this multitude of security challenges. And finally, I would like to pick up on another idea raised here that when multilateral frameworks are built, small states get a voice. And when they break down, it is the small states which are affected first and foremost. Given that most Atlantic states are not big states, there is a commonality of interest and in actually deepening the formal and informal multilateral institutional frameworks, I would argue. So overall, the seminar has highlighted that despite many national and divergent um, interests and goals, there is room for some commonality of interests that link together different regional areas of the Atlantic, from the Arctic to South America, from the Mediterranean to West Africa, from the Caribbean to Southern Africa, and for multilateral Atlantic institutions to continue engaging in shared security con concerns, connecting experience and sharing best practices of cooperation to function as a platform for political dialogue among the wider Atlantic community of experts, practitioners, and indeed also uh, at some point, the public. And to finish on a positive no note, the main takeaway this is to the Atlantic Center, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. We now invite the Deputy Director of the General Directorate for Foreign Policy from the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ana Paula Moreira, to make her closing remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Representatives from the Atlantic countries, EU institutions, international organizations and agencies. Representatives from the academic world, universities and institutes. Professor Isili Simão, coordinator for the Atlantic Center. Thank you for the invitation. Director for the National Defense Institute, Professor Elena Carreras. 
coordinators for the reflection group of the Atlantic on the Defense Institute, Professor Patricia Van Hart, uh, ambassadors, guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to say a few words at the end of this third seminar, a project that I have been accompanying for almost its inception, although I'm afraid I will be risking to be a bit and sound a bit repetitive since I see there is a lot of conversion of views with all what the predecessors have said. I want to congratulate the center for organizing this initiative that allowed indeed for the exchange of views and reflections on an item that is of common interest, the security and the stability of the old Atlantic. The Atlantic is one of the pillars of our foreign policy as is already stated. This arises from inescapable and well-known geographical and historical constraints. In fact, Portugal is a European nation with cultural roots in the Latin and Mediterranean cultures turned to the Atlantic that we have always seen as an open door into the world. That has led the way for Portugal to establish relations with partners from Africa, North and South America, Asia and beyond, from wherever the seas could take us to, leading us to perform the first globalization. As a European nation with the oldest fixed land borders already in the 13th century, Portugal has developed its foreign policy as a sovereign nation, striking a balance between its continental integration in Europe and its natural vocation to look at the Atlantic as a source of strategic depth. Since the 15th century, Portugal made a clear choice of crossing the oceans, looking for new realities, new cultures, new opportunities, giving birth to the Portuguese speaking world to the United in the Portuguese community of speaking, Portuguese speaking countries. This reality is very well portrayed by the Portuguese author Virgilio Ferreira in one of my favorite Portuguese sentences, the minha língua vê o mar, from my language, we can see the ocean. With the third largest continental preservation shelf in the world, at the crossroads of the North and South Atlantic between Europe, America and Africa, it is easy to understand why Portugal is so keen in promoting initiatives that contribute to the stability and development of the Atlantic, where our core geopolitical centrality lies. It was thus natural that Portugal was one of the founding members of NATO. A committed supporter of the transatlantic bond, Portugal has actively engaged in the promotion of the security and stability of the North Atlantic era area in a 360 approach. This means a comprehensive look at the threats and the challenges arising from different strategic directions, not just the East, but also the South, where new dangerous dynamics like terrorism are affecting the Atlantic area require an increased attention. For years, the Atlantic has been considered as a notion of security, growth, prosperity, and economic development. But several geopolitical, economic, and social developments, have, which has already discussed, been discussed, here are now challenging this notion. Climate change, as well as an illegal and report, illegal and reported and regulated fishing, organized crime networks, man-made disasters, the impressive number of piracy attacks, armed robbery, and kidnapping in Gulf of Guinea are nowadays a daily concern. To those wearing threats, we need to have new ones, like cyber threats the unpredictable risks presented by disruptive technologies and the great potential of hybrid threats being used in maritime disputes. On top of that, increased geopolitical competition among great powers for resources and trade routes pose a major risk for something taken for almost granted not too long, open seas and oceans. More than ever, before 
we depend on open and security seas and oceans, meaning both maritime safety and maritime security. When 90% of the world trading goods worldwide is sea-based, and more than 95% of intercontinental global internet traffic transits through undersea cables, carrying 10 trillion of financial transfers daily, it is clear there is need for action. We need to secure effective supply chains, fight transnational organized crime, protect common underwater resources and critical infrastructure, safeguard major economic sectors and preserve maritime environments. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a huge task. No country could have or answer those challenges alone. To safeguard open and secure seas and oceans governed by international law and commonly shared values within a multilateral rules-based order, we need to work together, joining efforts to succeed. As a staunch supporter of multilateralism, one of the another pillars of the Portuguese foreign policy, we are actively engaged in the United Nations efforts to address millennium goals, climate change, migration, and ocean sustainability. It is, this, this is why we are organizing together with Kenya the incoming Oceans Conference next year. In the same vein, we consistently worked in the development of EU maritime security strategy and made maritime security a priority of the Portuguese presidency of the EU uh, Council of European Union. We pushed, uh, sorry, presidency, we pushed to strength the EU's role as a global maritime security provider, namely in the Gulf of Guinea, where we are confronted with an increasingly worrying trend of attacks and instability. The EU has approved last semester a first ever pilot project of coordinated maritime presences that has already been touched upon, I think, during the, the discussions in the afternoon, focused on the Gulf of Guinea. This initiative aims at the effective coordination of naval and air assets by the EU member states. Through delegate, EU delegated cooperation, Portugal has also been implementing SWAMES, Support of West Africa Integrated Maritime Security, a project that provides forensic equipment, quick response assets, and capacity, capacity building to strengthen the management of the rule of law at the sea. As a firm believer in the value of cooperation and dialogue, Portugal is an active member of all the initiatives that contribute to the stability, security, and development of the Atlantic. We support the ONDE architecture in the promotion of a greater maritime security that we see benefits also from being complemented by the G7 plus plus plans of the Gulf of Guinea, which we are co-presiding in 2016 with Cape Verde. <coughs> Through the initiative Mar Aberto, Open Sea, and our bilateral defense cooperation with Portuguese speaking countries, we have been assisting countries building capacity in multiple domains. In the same spirit, we decided to develop the research center, Air Center, also based in the Azores, aiming at providing technological and scientific solutions for urgent needs in the Atlantic in the domains of the oceans, climate, and space. Ladies and gentlemen, the Atlantic Center fits exactly in the same logic. The new evolving political and security environment requires a global approach to the Atlantic that benefits from the active involvement, views, and experiences of different nations across and along both shores of the Atlantic. The discussions that took place today and added value of initiatives like Gulf of Guinea Maritime Coordinated Forum SHAPE, led by the Interregional Coordination Center and the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, from whose director we heard earlier today, or the ongoing work between UNODC, Nigeria, and Ghana on new legislation drafting on current trends of piracy and maritime insecurity show the benefits of multilateral and multinational initiatives. 
they also confirm that the Atlantic Center has a role to play as a wide platform of dialogue, exchange of experiences and best practices that brings together the whole of the Atlantic approach to the threats and challenges in a comprehensive manner. The fact that the Atlantic Center proposes a broader holistic approach to security that goes beyond the military understanding, though uh, it, it remains an essential aspect for deterrence and defense, encompassing the root, the root causes of insecurity brings added value to the multilateral and multinational cooperation. Because we believe in the merits of this exercise, we hope that to the 19 nations represented at the Atlantic Center that ensure a vast north to south participation, others will join and will be soon participating in the, in the activities of the Atlantic Center. With these few words, ladies and gentlemen, and in honor to be here today, I wish, like Patricia did, very good work, a fruitful follow up to the work that has been done. And I will certainly be sure will remain being active and interesting for all of you, for all of us. Thank you very much. We thank you all for your presence and collaboration. We formally declare the third seminar of the Atlantic Center closed.